myself. I've been working in the travel industry for 35 years. And then I began welcoming and introducing Canada to international travelers. I actually conducted a first presentation of the Niagara Falls Parkway for a TVO, which was aired internationally to all French speaking countries. At that time, that was 88 countries. I was awarded the Niagara Tourism Hospitality Mystery Award during that time. And in 2011, I joined CAA Niagara, um, and I was Tuxedo Tours as part of CAA Niagara, and, ha I, and has since accompanied groups to many interesting destinations. I am pr a proud recipient of the CAA's Niagara's Value Award also. So as a quick introduction to myself, and welcome. We're about to visit, explore, discover, and learn about Canada. So let's go. Fasten your seatbelt because I'm going to try to zoom through all these provinces. Okay. And here we have all the... I'm going to, I'm going to stop my... So you don't see me and you can see the, the screen. Uh, Ten provinces, three territories. And there we go. And the first one is Yukon. And in the Yukon, the first picture you see on your left-hand side is the Carcross Desert. It's commonly referred to as a desert, but it's actually a series of northern sand dunes. The area's climate is too humid to be considered a true desert, so the sand was formed during the last glacial period when large glacial lakes formed and deposited silt. When the lakes dried up, ta-da, the dunes were left behind. So basically, it's a tiny, the smallest desert apparently. In, and then we have the middle picture is the Yukon River. And that was uh, actually the motor transportation. It was one of the principal means of transportation during the Klondike Gold Rush in 1896 and 1903. And the last picture you have is the Kashkawush Glacier. Excuse me for the pronunciation. My French comes out once in a while. It is a, a, val uh, a vast valley glacier located in a, within the Kluane National Park. And uh, the glacier is the result of the conversion of two outlet glaciers. Eventually, it causes an, a tongue of ice that is 4.8 to 6.4 kilometers wide. So that is the first for that. And then we head to, to the sourdough thermometer. That is actually, many tales have become part of the folklore of the Klondike Gold Rush and the th sourdough thermometer is one of them. They found out that it would take two years to get a steel thermometer. So they decided to create their own. So someone had the idea of taking little pill bottles for them, taking a teaspoon of each of these ingredients, I'm gonna say in uh, one ingredient in each bottle. And that's how they could tell the temperature. So the first bottle would have quicksilver or mercury and they would freeze at minus 40 degrees Celsius. The second bottle will have coal oil that froze at minus 45 Celsius. Jamaica, Jamaica ginger, that surprised me. That one froze at 50 minus 51 Celsius. And the last it was a local remedy called the Perry Davis painkiller and it turned white at minus 51 Celsius. Apparently, once the, therm the mercury uh, thermometer showed that it was frozen, they didn't really kind of come out too, too much. It was a bit too cold. And then we have in the middle, we have the DOS, uh, uh, this is the, um, the Great Klondike International Outhouse Races in Dawson City. And that is a has been a tradition since the 1970s. It happens August 1st of every year. The race involves picking, you have to pick a theme, decorate an outhouse and wearing the costume centered on your chosen theme. Then running with and pushing the outhouse through the streets of, of Dawson City. And everyone's welcome. Everyone can, anyone can participate no matter what your mobility and age. And basically these outhouses are wheeled metal structures that resemble outdoor latrines. They are outfitted with a rickshaw like bars to help them push through the streets. And there's five participants per team, four to push the outhouse and one to sit on the throne. And apparently it's a huge event and they're judged and then they have a huge party after that. And then we have the gold rush. The Klondike gold rush was a, a, had over 100,000 prospectors in the Klondike region uh, 
in that between 1896 and 1899, and there's your gold bars. The next one is a sign for, it's actually the signpost forest. And that actually is a collection of signs at Watson Lake. And it, it was, Yukon is one of the most famous of, it, it is one of, the Yukon Forest is one of the most famous of the landmarks along the highway. It was started by a homesick GI in 1942. He was assigned light duty while recovering from an injury and erected the signposts for his hometown and that was Danville, Illinois. And since then, everyone that's visited have brought their own signs, so it's massive. And the, on the bottom left, the bottom picture is of course the Yukon Quest. I'm sure you've heard of that. And it's been run every February since 1984 across 1,000 miles or 1,600 kilometers of wilderness trail between Whitehorse, Yukon and Fairbanks, Alaska. It's an, this incredible international winter sport even starts regardless of weather conditions. The race lasts nine to 14 days, depending on weather, trail condition and team speed. The maximum, mush, uh, the maximum they can have is 50 mushers and each team can have up to 14 dogs. So, and then we'll head for the next picture. There we go. And now we are into the Northwest Territories. And that is uh, Yellowknife, the first picture you see on your left-hand side on top. It is the capital and only city. It's the largest community in the Northwest Territories and actually came to be because of the gold rush. And it's actually perched on a pink outcrops above the waves of the Great Slave Lake. The next picture looks like an igloo. It's actually called the Igloo Church. And it is the most photographed building in a town of Inuvik. And because it looks like an igloo, but it is actually called Our Lady of Victory Church. And it was designed by Father Jules Adam and built between 1958 and 1960 and with lots of community help. They didn't have much money. Father Adam was a master of innovation and creativity. So with all the designers in his head, apart from some sketches he made on plywood, the church was erected. You can actually tour the church in the summer when you're visiting. And then we have the Great Slave Lake. And it is actually these, uh, these uh, bo house, boat houses. And it, it's the, sec the Great Slave Lake is the second largest lake in Northwest Territories. And uh, basically, it's, uh, they're, they're houseboats. Uh, people live on them. They fish on them. And actually, there was a, a television program. It was the Ice Lake Rebels. It was a TV show, how they survived. And it is one of the most economical um, homes that th there is. They, they actually do not use, it's a, the houseboat community is truly a living of the grid. It began in the early 1980s. And there's two families built their own houseboats on the old river barge. And the community has grown over the years. And it is really, a, it's a very interesting, it's one of a kind. So these two pictures, summer and winter. And then we have the Pingos. And that is a very odd structure. It's kind of a kind of periglacial landform. It means, it, meaning that they are created through a process of freezing and thawing. It's covered with tundra on the outside and they contain a core of ice. They grow in much the same way as a can of pop expands as it freezes. And they can, the pingos can be as big as a football stadium or very, very small. And the Mackenzie Delta has the highest concentration of pingos on earth. And they use these pingos for uh, navigational aids. They also serve as a lookout with searching the tundra for caribou or scanning the seals for, for the sea for seals and whales. So it was actually quite useful for them. And we have the herd migration of caribous, and then we'll see you, I'm not gonna talk much about it. And then we have the Aurora Village, and that is actually a truly remarkable viewing experience. The facility, it's, it's actually a blend of traditional indigenous culture with modern amenities. The facilities provide maximum comfort and warmth, as well as um, very, multiple viewing areas, no obstructions, 
So you can see the northern skylights really well. And Aurora Village even offers a heated viewing seats to help you stay out in the cold a little longer. Or you can relax in, relax in these heated teepees that will keep you warm during your time in the village. And if you want to stay longer, you can do dog sledding, snowshoeing, and much more. And uh, on the left hand, uh, on the right hand side, you have a greenhouse. What they did, they actually took over an old hockey arena that's in Inuvik, and they actually did a community greenhouse. So they have over 200 members. They grow and sell their produce, and if they have uh, some leftover. They give them to the food banks and there's on the second floor, there's actually a yoga studio. So twice a week you can do yoga and then you can do gardening at the bottom. Now, basically thinking that you're in the Northwest Territories, they still have golfing. Golf reaches everywhere. So there is half a dozen courses situated in Northwest Territories, five of which are nine hole affairs. But there is one that was formed in 1948 the Yellowknife Golf Club is recognized as having the most northerly 18-hole course in the country. And because of its extreme location, golf lovers take notice, it holds the annual Canadian North Midnight Classic event over the weekend, closest to the 21st of June, the longest day. And then when golfers can play competitively into the wee small hours of the morning. So it sounds actually quite interesting. Okay, oh, there we go. And now the radio video, it just shows you the migration. It's about a minute long, but it sure is impressive. Over 3,000 reindeers. that cold but so we're next into British Columbia and the first one is Mount Robson Provincial Park in Berg Lake it's the second oldest park in British Columbia park system and it is actually part uh, is designated as part of the Canadian Rocky Mountains World Heritage Site by UNESCO now remember all these provinces all these parks they all have uh, trails, hiking trails and everything else. I'm just covering just a little bit of it. Capilano Suspension Bridge is north of Vancouver and it's about 140 meters long, 70 meters above the river and you get a wonderful view in there if you're not afraid of heights. But once you cross that, you end up in another world. You can do zip lining, these huge trees are there, there's museum, there's restaurants and uh, totem poles, there's a lot to do. The next one is oyster farming, and most of British Columbia's oyster farms are in the Strait of Georgia, the 100 mile inland sea stretching north of Vancouver. The strait is sheltered by Vancouver Island and offers endless calm hideaways for oysters, so they feel really comfortable. 60 of those oysters are produced in British Columbia and a primary farm species, if you're looking for buying Canadian bill, Canadian made oysters is the Pacific oyster. And the bottom, something I'll probably have tonight, the wine country, Okanagan Valley. And is a region, uh, it's actually known for its wineries and fruit orchards. The main city is Kelowna on the shores of the huge Okanagan Lake. And it's surrounded by pine forests and provincial parks. And the area around the cities of Kelowna, Vernon and Kamloops is home to several uh, 
uh, ski resorts also. And British Columbia is also known for blueberries and cranberries. They produce in large amount. In fact, one of the top three producers of these fruits in the world, so the cranberries. And next we have the BC Temperate Forest, way on top, whoops, sorry. The picture way on top on the left-hand side. Close to 25% of the world's temperate uh, rainforest is in BC. Most of it is coastal, but there is one that's more inland and that's the home of the ancient forest, a rare inland rainforest near P Prince George. And if you walk through these trails of the ancient forest, if you walk into the ancient forest trails, you'll be going past thousand year old Western red cedars and the rich bio biodiversity of plants. Can you imagine? And some of these trails are really very well up kept and it's almost like you're going back in time. Now going back from the past to the present and I love tree houses. I hope you guys do too because this is a quirky tree house, it's called the Free Spirit Spheres. Try to say that fast. That picture in the middle and the picture that's underneath the rainforest, um, the one in the middle on the left-hand side, that's the inside of the sphere. And they're cool, they're quirky, they're truly unique. They're special, the spherical tree houses. They offer an exquisite combination of back to nature experience with a trendy phenomenon of glamping. Glamping is luxury camping. So you, you get nature, you get a bit of comfort and the world is the world, this is a world renowned unique accommodation. And it's set among the coastal rainforest of Vancouver, Vancouver Island. The picture here, the one that's in the picture is actually called Melody. There's another sphere that's called Aaron. They all have names and it has a private electric composting outhouse adjacent to the sphere and it's private and she is wired for, uh, for 120 volts AC. So there you go. And the little bear on the right-hand side, that's our spirit bear. And there's all, it's a rare subspecies of bears unique to, the pro, to BC. The Kermod or spirit bear is a black bear that has white fur due to a rare genetic trait. The bear is not albino. It has, ha, typically has a brown nose and eyes. The greatest concentration of spirit bears are found central coast of, and north coast of British Columbia. So they are just amazing, beautiful little bears, but they're, they're cuddly, but don't get too close. Whale watching, the prime whale watching season in British Columbia is between April and late October. And you can get to spot killer whales, humpbacks and grays. Just bring your binoculars. Okay, now, did you know that BC's capital city, located on Vancouver Island, has an annual flower count at the end of the winter? Each year, the community gets together to count more than 1 billion blooms. I lose count after 20. Okay, two thirds of British Columbia's land base is forest land. And the hanging garden tree that is called on Mears Island, close to Tofino, is one of the oldest known Western red cedars. And it's estimated to be 1,500 to 2,000 years old. Wow. And Nanaimo, a coastal city of Vancouver, is the bathtub racing capital of the world. Yeah. And the first race took place in 1967. So now we have an outhouse race, and then we have a bathtub race. I think they're developing a bit of a theme there. And then we head for Alberta. Now Vulcan is a city in Alberta. It is lovely known as Canada's quirkiest town. And to promote tourism in the area, they built a 31 foot enterprise replica from Star Trek next to the spaceship shaped visitor center. Now, if you go there, the sculpture plaque is written in three languages, English, Vulcan and Klingon. Try that one. Alberta is also known for to be the only rat free zone in North America. They spend millions of dollars trying to keep the province free from, from the rats. Right, and then we head to the Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump World Heritage Center. And it is uh, located where the foothills of the Rocky Mountains begin to rise from the plains. This is where vast quantities of buffalo or 
American bison skeletons can be found. And there are evidence of a custom practice by Aboriginal people for North American plains for nearly 6,000 years. They had an excellent knowledge of the topography and of buffalo behavior. So they killed their prey by chasing them over a precipice. And that was a whole kind of event for them. And the, the carcasses, they used them for food, they used them for uh, clothing, for tools, for everything. So nothing was wasted. The slide in the middle, it is, it's writing on stone, UNESCO World Heritage Site. And indigenous people came from centuries and recorded their experience and visions on the sandstone cliffs of the Milk River Valley. This extensive rock art collection depicts generations of knowledge, tradition, and history. And you can actually hike the trails there. You can have a guided tour of it. It's a massive park and it's everyone's welcome. And of course, Drumheller, the dinosaur capital of the of uh, Canada or of the world, basically. And that's where we have the Alberta Badlands. This is also where you find the Royal Tyrell Museum. And it is a, it has, it features one of the world's largest displays of dinosaurs. So it sounds like really, really a fun. So Alberta is home to 16 UNESCO regions. The first one is Waterton Glacier International Peace Park and World Heritage Site. It is also known as an international dark sky park for stargazing. There's no lights, it's all natural, and you can bring a blanket, you can bring um, a, you know, anything, and you can to really see the skies and the stars. Then you have the Dinosaur Provincial Park. Over 49 different species of dinosaurs have been found there and head smashed in Buffalo Jump, I just talked about. The Wood Buffalo National Park, Canada's largest national park, contains half of the world's endangered word bison population. And then we have the Canadian Rocky Mountain Parks. They include Banff, Jasper, Kootenay, and Yoho National Parks, and Mart Robson, Mount Assiniboine, and Hamber Provincial Parks. That is a huge combination. And we're in Alberta, and now we have the Columbia as ice fields. And if that is the top one that you're looking at is actually the Columbia Icefield Parkway. And I've driven, I've been through it. It is amazing. You can, you have over 100 ancient glaciers, turquoise lakes, wildlife, and you can stop at different places. And all of a sudden you walk through the bush a little bit and then you have this beautiful turquoise lake right in front of you. So it is an amazing place to visit. Amolite, the little gem that you see in the middle, that is actually, they, they're, they're derived from the colorful shells of 70 million year old Alberta ammonite fossils. These chairs, these are rare gems. And basically they are attributed, um, they were in 1981, Amolite was awarded the official gem status by the World Jewelry Confederation. Apparently the gem contains Earth's energy, supposedly, and they are supposed to symbolize good luck, prosperity. All the colors have a different symbol. I'm not gonna go through them, but it gives you an idea. And right to the right-hand side, you have, we have the big Columbia Icefield bus, and those tires are actually higher than us. And you get on those things, they take you down to the Athabasca Glacier, and it's the most popular glacier in, uh, visited glacier in North America. You can walk on it, just please make sure you have proper shoes to go on it. And it is, the glacier is melting, so some people do drink the water from it, but it's an experience, unforgettable experience. On the far left, again, at the bottom is the Tabasca Falls. And as the glacier receded, the Tabasca River, which or originates from the Columbia Ice Field, flowed through this narrow gorge and fell 23 meters over a cliff, causing a class five waterfall. And way to the right, one of my very, very favorite lakes is Lake Moraine. It's a glacially fed lake in Banff National Park. It, um, it has a vivid shade of turquoise that changes intensity through the summer as the glaciers melt. 
It is set in the rugged valley of the Ten Peaks. Now, that vista from the top is known as a $20 view because the scene, this scene is featured at the back of the Canadian $20 bill that was issued between 1969 and 1979. So when you look at the back and you look at the back of the $20 bill, you see those 10 peaks, the Valley of the 10 Peaks. Even if it's crowded in there, you can walk around the lake. It's peaceful all of a sudden. You can canoe on the lake. It is a, an amazing experience. And now there's another video. It's a quick one about Alberta. And here it goes. you saw was actually uh, Calgary and by the way you can actually rent um, oh. sorry I'm having some issues right here Let me, there we go can you hear me now <laughs> and basically you can rent um, a ranch uh, work, you can actually hire to work on the working ranch in Alberta, and I'm having trouble getting, okay, there we go. I'm sorry, I'm trying to move the picture and it doesn't want to move. Okay. There we go. So, sorry about that. Oh no, tell me it's gonna start again. <laughs> I'm not really techy, techy, so there so we go. The rescue, quick. <laughs> yeah, help. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm trying. No, that's not what I want. There we go. Yeah. I'm screen sharing, but. Uh, Okay, I've got that. Now I'm trying to move this one over and this one over. No, that's not what I want. Sorry, folks. Oh. 
<clears throat> no, that's not it. Well, it just doesn't want to move from there. Okay, so I got you, and I got that, and I got that. Ah, ta-da! Finally, sorry folks. Okay, we're in Saskatchewan, and there's 70 First Nations in Saskatchewan, and Cree is the second most spoken language in the province. And then we have the, the fields, and then we end up with this, the Tabasca Sand Dunes Provincial Park. This is where they do, instead of doing snowboarding, they do sandboarding, they do sand tobogganing. And it's, it's actually uh, a unique boreal shield ecosystem located in the far north Saskatchewan. The Tabasca Sand Dunes are one of the most northerly active sand dunes formations on Earth. They're leftovers from millions of years of glacial activity and the remnants of once a, ma of a, a once massive lake. What was had left behind are pockets of active sand dunes that rise out of the surrounding floor and they actually do move, they do change. And then we have the purple beaches. And the purple beaches are located in numerous places throughout the province, such as Prince Albert National Park, Candle Lake, the Shambo Lake, Hunter, Hunter Bay, and Good Spirit Lake. You'll find the odd beach that is purple. It is really quite a sight to behold as the sand shimmers in the light. Geologists think that garnet, the purple sand, was carried south from their home in the Canadian Shield and deposited in these lakes. Over time, the less dense garnet rises to the top and we're left with these gorgeous purple beaches. That sounds actually quite interesting. Okay, and then we end up in Moose Jaw. Now, if you take a look at the left-hand side, the two pictures, one on top of the other, actually are Moose Jaw tunnels. Now, Moose Jaw is the fourth largest city in Saskatchewan. And in 1908, an extensive city system of tunnels were dug beneath Mucha. They wanted to, to, with the intention of running the city on steam power. That did not work very, that didn't last very long. So people started using them. First of all, there were Chinese immigrants. Some of them were indentured servants, some were railroad workers, other open laundromats, restaurants to cater to the population, population of mostly single male miners. And they tried to avoid the head count tax. Um, they were trying to escape from the racial persecu persecution of what they were called the yellow peril at that time. Then in the 1920s, they had another interest. There was a prohibition and the rum runners used the, the tunnels to store alcohol. They and they would transport it to the Sioux Line Railroad, which ended up in Chicago in the US. And eventually there were functioning speakeasies underneath the streets of Moose Jaw. And, every, and there was rumors that Al Capone actually took part in this bootlegging uh, uh, thing in, in Moose Jaw. And it's a possibility that it might have been true. Apparently at that time, the police force in Moose Jaw was not as um, up to standard as they should have been. So, the Musha tunnels, you can visit, you can tour them and everything else. Now the middle picture with the lady in the lake, that is actually the Manitou Lake. And it is um, east of Saskatoon. It is three times saltier than the ocean. The indigenous people claim that these were healing waters. Well, in a way they have to be, they, they're almost healing. It's almost um, impossible to sink in this lake. And right there on one of the, on the edge of the lake, there's the European style spa and hotel. And it is the only one of its kind in Canada. And then we have to the far right, we have the grain elevators. And the grain elevators in Western Canada have for years been referred to the prairie icons, the prairie cathedrals, prairie sentinels and they become a visual symbol of what farming in this part of the country was all about. And uh, they, were, they were the first step in a grain trading process that moves the grain from producer to worldwide markets. They were designed for one purpose only, getting the grain into railway boxcars. But uh, what happens, a lot of these railways close and the, the 
the grain elevators were discontinued and a lot of them disappeared. Okay. And now we end up in Manitoba. And Manitoba has more curling clubs than Ontario or Quebec combined. It is often referred as a curling club of Canada. So that's a top picture you're seeing on the left-hand side. Then right in the middle, Winnipeg boasts one of the longest skating trails in the world. You start downtown at the Forks. The trail leads skaters down the Red and Acetaboyne Rivers over a length of between six and nine kilometers. And there's actually warming huts along the way. And those warming huts were designed by architects from all over the world. Now, in the beginning, I said there's a, uh, you can hike and you can do a lot of things in all these provinces. The Western provinces all have fantastic festivals, all kinds geared to their own specialty. But there is one festival that is the largest winter festival, and that is the Festival du Voyageur, the Festival of the Traveler. And you'll see it's on the right-hand side picture, excuse me, the top one. On the left-hand side bottom, we have the bison. It's Manitoba's official mammal. The Plains bison has been tried and is has been a tried and true symbol of Manitoba since 1870. You'll see it on their coat of arms, on the flag, in the provincial government's logo, everywhere. And there's even in the Riding Mountain National Park is a bison hotspot. They have a herd of about 40 Plains bison. And right on the right hand side, you have the town of Gimli and it's an Icelandic community. It's on the west shores of Lake Winnipeg. It is the largest Icelandic community outside of Iceland. And to commemorate that, they have the Viking statue right in the middle of Western province. And then we go to Churchill, the first on the left-hand side. Is the Aurora Borealis. Is one of the uh, Churchill is one of the top three places in the world to observe the Northern Lights. And then when we move over, we have the Crown Royal. And again, Gimli, I'm starting to think what's in, I wonder what's in that Gimli. There they have the Crown Royal's distillery in Gimli, Manitoba. They produce, it's home to 1.5 million barrels of delicious whiskey that sits patiently waiting to be shared with the world. The property is uh, stretches over 360 scenic acres with 51 warehouses, which house more barrels of whiskey than our people in Manitoba. Hmm, sounds very interesting. And then we go back to Churchill because they are known as a polar bear capital of the world. That's our polar bear right there, sitting there. And uh, Churchill has no paved roads to going into the area. So you have to fly in. And once you visited Churchill, the polar bears, even the beluga whales, we have dog sledding. So there's something to do, there's something for everyone to do. Now, did you know James Bond was the famous World War II spy master, Sir William Stevenson, who happened to be born and raised in Winnipeg, the inspiration for James Bond anyway. The character of Winnie the Pooh, I'm sure you know this one, was inspired by a black bear named Winnie, who was named after Manitoba's capital city, Winnipeg. And Snow White illustrator Charles Thorson grew up in Gimli. There we go, Gimli again. You've got to visit that place. It sounds interesting. It is widely believed that the Snow White character created for Disney Studios was based on the waitress Thorson met at a diner in the West End of Winnipeg. Now, I didn't get a picture for the next one because Manitoba has the biggest mating dens anywhere in the world. That is for the red-sided garter snakes. Mm. They come out in the thousands in early May to the Narcissus dens to mix, mingle, and mate. It's party time. And they form huge, writhing balls of snakes. It's, and it makes great viewing, especially around Mother's Day. And I didn't do a picture because I didn't want to gross anybody out. But if you go on the website, it is massive amount of snakes. It's incredible. The Hudson Valley Bay has over 25,000 beluga whales that visit, 3,000 of which will visit the Churchill area from June on. And, and you can kayak with them. And we're into none of it. We're making progress. We're almost halfway through. Nunavut is a massive, sparsely populated territory. 
and there are four official languages in Nunavut, Inuktitut, English, French, and oh my goodness, Inuktun. And uh, Inuktitut is the mother tongue of 70% of the people there. The first picture you see is a gentleman making an igloo, and that's a workshop. If you visit Nunavut, you can enroll in a workshop. You'll discover the basics of one of the Inuit's oldest survival techniques. If you're caught in a snowstorm, you know how to take protection by building an igloo. Learn how to select the best snow, cut your own snow blocks, practice block placement, and after you've done your igloo, you can enjoy hot tea and snacks in the shelter of your new home. Also on the right hand side, none of it has no access except by sea or air. So that is one of the ships that takes you in through the glaciers, takes you into none of it. And also Arctic char, the people of none of it traditionally catch and sun dry their, their char uh, along the, uh, you know, once they catch it. And it's a very popular food. Now I'm not talking too much of none of it because there's a video that I'm about to show you, and it's all about none of it. And I hope you enjoy because it it's quite a whoops, it's quite informative. High up in the north, the largest, wintriest, and most obscure place in Canada is. Can you guess? It's the one and only beautiful and traditional Nunavut. Its beauty is beyond compare. Very picture worthy. From the fascinating Inuition culture. To the astonishing Northern Lights. Every moment is worth it. Nanot's area is 2 million square kilometers. That's a lot of space for only 31,000 Inuits. This territory is mostly tundra and a little bit of boreal and Tiaga forests in the south. It consists of three landforms, the Inishian Mountains, they are covered with glittering ice sheets, tall mountains, and are barren. Arctic lowlands. They are barren, have rolling landscape, and low-lying land. Canadian Shield. It has rounded hills, flat land, rocks, and thin coniferous trees surrounding. Think that's it? No, it's just the beginning. The countless activities here. Dog sledding. Who wouldn't love a wonderful <laughs> ride led by Canadian Eskimo dogs? see great animals. There are bowheads, seals, muskox, polar bears, countless bird species, and arctic fox. <laughs> Don't forget to come hiking at Ayuatuk National Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Snowmobiling is a must do. <laughs> Visit the glorious Sylvia Grinnell Park and camp out at Sermolet National Park. Explore the unique Floet, a place where frozen seas meet the open seas. Hello. Remember to come canoeing at Canada's most northerly place, oui, oui, the Tinic National Park. Wait, have a Don't miss a chance to come by a tree or do some fishing. They've got Arctic char. Delicious. The festivals are really what shows off the Nunavut culture, such as the Inu Merit and the Alia Nate Arts Festival. And the amazing art they do. 
Bring back home the Inuit culture. Make sure you come for a cruise. Oh no, iceberg! Is this gonna be Titanic too? No, don't worry. These ice breaking and luxurious ships are very good builds and also have very nice trained staff. Nunavut is rich in unique vegetation. They include stuff such as arctic willows, wildflowers, sedges, shrubs, lichens, and mosses. The best time to travel to Nunavut is in spring. The temperature in summer can reach up to 10 degrees. Winters are cold and are negative 35 degrees. These temperatures are really large. Since Nunavut has a continental climate, it also has more precipitation in summer. Some tips for tourists are, bring sunscreen, dress warmly, don't pet any of the animals, and really, fill up your journey with as much excitement as possible. There's no limit. Wish you all the best. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. We're in Ontario. And basically, the first picture you see is the Trans Severn Waterway National Historic Site. 44 locks, 104 operable dams, six heritage lock stations, and a long 386 kilometer scenic string of canals and waterways. People you rent the boathouses, houseboats to travel the Trans Severn Waterway. You can take your boat, you can stop along the way to the little cities and towns. It's a wonderful uh, way to spend the summer. And the amethyst in the middle picture represents Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay is the heart of amethyst country. It's found, the, the amethyst is found in quality, quantity, and it's found in Thunder Bay and the North Shores of Lake Superior. And Thunder Bay is, has the largest Finnish population per capita outside of Finland. Thunder Bay produces more professional hockey players per capita than any other city in the world. And also, if you love amethyst, there's actually some open pit mines that you can actually go yourself and pick and try to dig for your own amethyst. And of course, on the right-hand side, the Phantom 5 National Marine Park. And it's a freshwater ecosystem with ancient rock formations, cliff edge forests, and fascinating dive sites on 22 shipwrecks. You can actually take a glass bottom boat tour to the Flower Pot Island and the glass, the, uh, the glass bottom tour boat, you can actually see some of these wrecks also. So just enjoy and that is quick overview of Ontario since that's where we live. And then the part, then we go to Kingston. In Kingston, the top right picture, the uh, top left, I'm top left picture. Kingston is a very important city in Ontario and Canada. It's a gorgeous city. It used to be an important military base in the British Empire, especially during the War of 1812. It was Canada's first capital city. It's home to the national historic sites, military institutions, and more. The picture you're seeing is a Kingston Penitentiary. It is Canada's oldest and most notorious maximum security prison. Now, it is open for tours. Um, after the COVID, uh, uh, anyways, one suggestion, if you're visiting the Kingston prison during a tour and they tell you you can go in the cells, do not close the door. They lock. And a lot of those cells, they do not have the keys for them. So you may become a semi-permanent residence for a couple, for a day or so. And then to the, uh, then we have the Agua Canyon tour. That's the bottom picture underneath the penitentiary. And it starts at the Sault Ste. Marie. You, um, you, it's a day long train ride. I recommend the fall because the foliage is so gorgeous. You go through canyons, you see lakes, you see rivers. Once in a while, you'll see wildlife and you end up in the Agua Canyon. That was uh, the group of seven was inspired by. You can go to Bridalville Falls, you can go, to the Black Beaver Falls. And if you have a lot of energy, you can climb 300 steps up to the observation level. It is a wonderful time. Uh, on the train, it's narrated so you know where you are. So hopefully uh, you'll enjoy that. And then we have the Wellington County Museum and, and Archives. That's on your right-hand side, the top picture. 
and it's, it is housed in the earliest surviving example of a poor house, later called the House of Industry in Canada, which was built in 1877. It's now a National Historic Site. The museum houses two floors of exhibits which tell the stories of Wellington County people, places and events, and it is a state of the art. Now we did visit the Wellington Museum this uh, last year for a mystery tour, and it is so well done. And it's where people couldn't afford they couldn't live anywhere else. They needed a place to stay. They put you to work, but it is really well done. And then we head to Quebec. And the first one is Fermont, Le Chateau Montebello. That is not the chateau. That is the entrance gate. That's what you would drive through the chateau. And it's, it's known as, a, it has rustic charm. Uh, some people call it the world's largest log cabin, but it's very welcoming. And on a cool night, they have this massive four-sided fireplace in the lobby. And it's open, uh, all the levels are opened. So you can sit and listen to music and enjoy the campfire. And if you love golfing, they have a very uh, challenging golf course there also. Golfers from all over the world come there to play. The middle picture is actually Orléans, Orléans, Orleans Island, and it has about 7,000 permanent residents. It's, um, it's a beautiful island. It is um, agricultural, it has orchards, it has cabana sucre, sugar, um, sugar shacks, it has um, restaurants and everything else. It's, it's such another way of living. You get to relax. It is so different. Then on the far right, you have Montmorency Falls, 15 minutes from the old city, the old Quebec City. And if you're very brave, you can actually take the cable car to the top of the hill to admire the falls from a unique vantage point. And then if you really get even more daring. You can cross a suspended bridge to the Belvedere where you can feel the power of the river as it thunders past. So there you go. And then the Pac Omega, the bottom picture on the left hand side. The Pac Omega opened its doors in the public 1991. It is so great. Um, we do tours in there like uh, um, CAA. We're journeyed by CAA Niagara. We take tours there. We actually rent the park's bus. It's an old school bus. The window's open. They give us a bag of carrots and the drivers are tour guide. And as you drive along, the, the animals come along and you can feed them from the window. You don't get out. And you can take your own car in there also. They have different summer events. They have winter events. The Pac Omega is, and it's only an hour away from Ottawa also. So there you go. And then we have Trois Rivières or Three Rivers, and that is Borealis, the Museum Borealis, and tells you the story of the pulp and paper mill industry. And Trois Rivières is a geographic location, is at the confluence of two major rivers. It was an important trading post for exchanges between Europeans and First Nations. And it just eventually, because of where it was, it just, the economy just took off. And now they've saved the Borealis as a museum. It's really well done. And if you want to take a look and, and, and Trois-Rivières has so many, much more to offer. There's a whole bunch of different things. On the right-hand side, you have L'Oratoire Saint-Joseph or St. Joseph Oratory at of Mont-Royal. And it is a Roman Catholic minor basilica in National Shrine. It's located on Mont-Royal's Westmount Summit in Montreal. It's a National Historic Site of Canada and is Canada's largest church. And apparently it has one of the largest church domes in the world. And it was found in 1904. It is the highest building in Montreal. It's 30 meters above Mont Royal Summit, which you weren't supposed to do, but they did. And people, if you look at the picture really closely uh, leading up to the uh, oratoire, it's all stairs. And people climb those, or they climb with their knees, or some, sometimes on their knees. And when you get into the oratoire Saint Joseph, there's all different chapels. One has all the crutches people supposedly healed. One is to pray for people out of jobs. And believe it or not, the first time I went there, my husband was out of work for a long time and it was getting pretty bad. So I just took a chance. I just said a little prayer in that little chapel. And about that afternoon, I found out that he had been called back to work. Coincidence, but hey, it worked. So it's, it's belief, trust and belief. 
bottom left picture is La Baie Saint Benoit du Lac. It's in the Eastern Townships, and those are the Benedictine, it's a Benedictine community. It was founded in 1912, and it's basically they live a monastic life, but they survive. But they earn their living because they have a cheese factory. They have two orchards, a cider mill, and a shop where they sell their products. And the doors of the church and guest house are open to anyone wishing to share prayer or take time for inner peace. And it is very peaceful. On the right-hand side, Vignob Saint Gabriel. It's an organic vineyard, and it's uh, it has 35,000 vines. The unique wine cellar has 125 French oak barrels. They offer guided tours, wine tasting. They have lavender products. They have two antique tractor museums and, of course, walking trails. There's lots to do. You can taste your wine and, you know, you know kind of walk it off, come back, taste again. It is actually a beautiful area. And then we end up in New Brunswick. And that's the dune. La Dune de Boctouche and La Saguine, the two pictures on the left-hand side, the one on top and the one in the middle. And that is, uh, this, the beach, the, discover the beaches stretching as far as the eye can see and the 17 kilometers of walking and biking paths that extend from the Boctouche Dunes to the Pays de la Saguine. The Pays de la Saguine is a performance, it's Acadian. It teaches you the customs, the songs, the dance, the food. It's a celebration. So if you want to visit Le Pays, Le, La Sag, Le Pays de la Saguine. And the middle picture, of course, you're familiar with that, the Hoopa Rocks is the most unique tidal formation in North America. There's a, that's where the highest tides in the world are. It measures up to 19 meters. It occurs daily. You can walk on the ocean floor and you can have guided tours. Just keep an eye when the tide comes up. And so that's about it. On the right-hand side, Shadiac. It's, can, it's a town in the Westmoreland County in New Brunswick. It's known for as the Calopsir capital of the world. And guess what? It has a festival every July, promotes a tie to lobster fishing. So it has a lobster fish, uh, lobster festival. And if that wasn't enough, at the western entrance of the town, they have a 90 ton sculpture called the world's largest lobster. So they really know how to advertise, but it is fun. And they do a cruise there. I love the cruising. And then we have St. Andrews at the bottom of the left, left of the picture, the left, the bottom picture. That is St. Andrews. And when the United States, um, British, uh, during the, excuse me, when the, when the United States of America became independent from the British rule, the colonists, the people that remained loyal to the British crown, they found themselves a bit in a quandary. And they were looking for a place of refuge. So that place turned out to be America's friendly upstairs neighbors, us, Canada. So the town of St. Andrews, was established in 1783 when approximately 14,000 loyalists fled across the main border. Many of the original houses in town were brought piece by piece from Castine, Maine, or Castine, Maine, by boat or barge down the St. Croix River and rebuilt to be occupied by newfound Canadians. And the town was designated a Canadian National Historic District. So that is our first view of New Brunswick. We're continuing with Minister's Island. Take a look at the two pictures on the left-hand side, the top and the, and the middle. When the tide is low, you can drive across the ocean floor, but you have to be very aware of your tide schedules. And then you end up on Minister's Island. And Minister's Island was originally, um, occupied by Passamaquoddy Indians centuries ago, and then the Europeans came. The island was eventually sold to a Reverend Samuel Andrews, and he was very popular minister, so Minister's Island. And in, in 1891, Sir William Van Horn, the president of the Canadian Pacific Railway, began purchasing pieces of the island to build his 50-room summer home. Eventually, he owned the whole island. But you still can hike, you can visit the mansion. You can, there apparently there's even a hammock somewhere you can, if you can find it on top of a cliff where you can have a beautiful view. But remember, if the tide goal comes back in, 
it's 20 feet of water over that little roadway and you're kind of stuck on the island for a little while. Now the middle picture is the Hartman Heartland Bridge, 1,282 feet in length. It's the longest co uh, covered bridge um, in the world. It, is, uh, it does have a pedestrian walkway that runs along one side of the bridge so that you can admire the river and can take a leisurely stroll. The road through the covered span is only one lane. So cars must wait with other, while others pass. But that just means all the more time to appreciate the long and rustic bridge and hope you're not claustrophobic. Now, the last picture on the right-hand side is St. John's, and historic St. John is a settlers from St. John's. Uh, people, again, when the people that say Lord of the British Crown, uh, they, they fled to Canada. So the two fleets of ships from Massachusetts, they escaped the American Revolution, they settled down here. And in 1877, there was a huge fire. It was called the Great Fire. And it, it basically burnt 21 entire streets. So they rebuilt. And apparently, the buildings that rose from the ashes were all the style of that period. They left St. John with some Canada's best Victorian architecture. But a lot of people said that the styles of what that period resembled Boston. And that's because when they rebuilt, a lot of the architects came from Boston. So they just built what they knew. And the bottom left corner is a, is a beach, it's Parley Beach Provincial Park. And it's fan, fine sands, warm waters that reach up to 20 degrees Celsius. This makes the beaches on the Nunthurland Strait, north of Moncton, some of the finest in the Atlantic coast. And it is crowded, I've seen them, they're very busy. And we're now in Nova Scotia. And that is Alexander Graham Bell and his museum right at the bottom. Those two statues are in Badek, Nova Scotia. And Alexander Graham Bell was a teacher. He began as a teacher of deaf and, and hearing impaired people. Mabel was one of his students. Uh, he actually led Canada to the first powered flight, the world's fastest watercraft, advanced recording technology, and of course the telephone. He was an inventor. He was he. He had so many ideas. He was a scientist, a teacher, and many of these remarkable inventions are actually in the museum and it's hands-on, so it's really worth looking at. And Nova Scotia, the top picture in the middle, that is Cabot Trail, 100 and 300 kilometers. It, it, does a, it brings the northwest coast of Cape Breton Island and the Cape Breton Highland National Park. It is an amazing one, but one word of recommendation, I don't care how fit you are, beware, there's a lot of hills. If you do decide to do bicycling, put a little motor behind that bicycle because some of those hills are massive. And the Celtic Lodge is the one in the middle underneath the Cabot Trail. It's a resort hotel located in the village of Inganish and it has is in proximity of the Highland Links. One of the, it was the number one golf course in Canada. And of course the giant the world's largest fiddle is located on the Sydney waterfront, and it's because Nova Scotia is known for its music. It's the heart of the of the province, and then, and now we are in, up to the Royal National Ta International Tattoo, and uh, that is something that is so amazing. I don't know if you've seen it on TV. It's impressive on TV, but if you see it in person, is amazing. It gives you the goosebumps. So the Nova, the Nova, Royal Nova Scotia International Tattoo features the best pipes, drums, bands, dancers, singers, choirs, acrobats, name it, military pomp. It is supported by the Canadian Armed Forces, the Government of Canada, and the province of Nova Scotia. And that is something we've included in our tour for in June for, uh, for the Atlantic provinces. Now, Pier 21, the middle picture is the Canadian Museum of Immigration. Pier 21 is a national historic site, which, has the, which was the gateway to Canada for one million immigrants between 1928 and 1971. My husband's grandparents came through there. They also serve as a departure point for 368,000 Canadian military personnel during the Second World War. 
So today, Pier 21 hosts the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21. Now, if you decide to visit Pier 21, bring Kleenexes with you. That is a museum that has a very much an emotional um, effect on people. It is incredible the stories that come out that you listen to and how it's presented. It's really well done. And of course, we have Lunenburg on the right hand side and is a port town of the south shore of Nova Scotia. I love Lunenburg. And it's, it was founded in 1753. It was, one of, it was the first British attempt to settle Protestants in Nova Scotia. The economy was traditionally based on offshore fish. Today, Lunenburg is the site of Canada's largest secondary fish processing plant. It, was, it took part in the rum running at one point. It was a shipbuilding port town. That's where the Blue Nose was created. And it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's actually a postcard perfect Lunenburg. It has some very colorful houses. It has hills. It has history, great restaurants, great food. And then we end up at the bottom on the left-hand side. I know you have to recognize that. That is the lighthouse for uh, Peggy's Cove. Oh, wait a minute, I, I skipped one. The, mo the middle one under the Royal Nova Scotia tattoo, that is the, Cit the Halifax Citadel National Historic Site. It was built in 1856 as a fort. It never saw battle. And so today the barracks are there, they're well preserved. They have guides that give you tours. They are, there's great air enactments, concerts, uh, musket salutes and everything else. So that's, it's right on top. The view is so gorgeous. And then we have Peggy's Cove at the bottom. And Nova Scotia has 160 historic lighthouses. And the most popular and most famous of them all is Peggy's Point Lighthouse. And it's one of the, probably the most photographed in Canada. And it's located in the quaint fishing village of Peggy's Cove along the South Shore. And it was built in 1915. And now we're in Prince Edward Island. P, we're moving. Talk about doing the country in a short time. PI has is famous for its red soil. That's the first picture. And it's a color from the high iron content when it oxidizes to exposed to the air. The middle picture, those are potato fields. And agriculture is the PI's largest industry. Nearly half of the island's land is dedicated to farming. Potatoes have been produced in PEI since early, as early as 1771. And today PEI grows a third of Canada's potatoes and the island seed potatoes are exported to more than 20 countries. Now on the right hand side, oh, I forgot to take some things. Uh, the, we have the bottle houses, that's in Wellington. There's three fantasy like buildings made up of approximately 30,000 recycled glass bottles of various colors and sizes, surrounded by beautiful flower gardens. It's a haven for nature lovers, recyclers, or photographers. It is so nice. It is so peaceful. The late Edouard Arsenault built the structures in the early 80s, and he spent the last four years of his life in this amazing project. And when he decided to do this, he was hunting for bottles. So he'd go behind the bars and the restaurants, he'd go in the trash looking for bottles. Well, people thought he, might, he had a bit of an issue or alcohol issue at one point, but he got the bottles, he would take the labels off, wash them, and then assemble them. There's a chapel all done with, with bottles. There's a, a house, a bar, it is really worth visiting. And of course, the middle picture on the left-hand side, the musician, those Acadian uh, music. The music and songs have always been important as part of Acadian culture. The Acadians brought hundreds of old French songs, many of which were originally accompanied by dances to each area, uh, re each region of the maritime provinces where they settled. And it is so true. <clears throat> it gets your feet tapping and you just it just brings the, joy into you. It just makes you feel good. Okay, the local author, Lucy Maud Montgomery, wrote Anne of Green Gables. It was published in 1908. The book setting is near Cavendish Beach, and the house that inspired the book is now a, nas a national historic site. So there you go. The bottom picture is Anne of Green Gables. Now, we have harness racing. 
every August at the Red Shores Racetrack and Casino in Charlottetown, you have the Gold Cup and Salsa Race. It is a 60,000 purse race. It's the most prestigious harness race east of Ontario. And you just can go there and, and, and watch it. And of course, there's a casino if you're interested. The Confederation Bridge is the next one in the middle. And it opened 1997. It joins New Brunswick to PEI. The eighth mile long bridge takes 12 minutes to cross, depending on your speed limit or the, how fast you're going. And it is the world's longest bridge over ice covered waters. Now, there are cameras all over that bridge. You're not allowed to stop. If you break down, they're on you like so fast because you would be blocking all the traffic, but they're very particular. You have to be careful. Lobster fishing, lobster season happens twice a year on PEI from May 1st until the end of June and from mid-August to mid-October. So the lobster traps on the right-hand side. And at the bottom left, we have Province House is where the Prince Edward Island legis Legislature, known as the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, has met since 1847. It is a set, Charlottetown, is Canada's second oldest seat of government. Now, I know the windmills and wind power is getting very, um, I don't know, popular, but it's growing in every province. But the wind power on PEI generates as much as 15% of electricity used on PEI. And of course, we have oyster farming, and that is really growing quite a bit. The last time I was on the island, I saw a lot of the farms. It's a, it's one of the country's biggest oyster producers. It exports to major markets across North America and Asia. Its excellence in oysters stems from the region and the region's abundance of bay filled with cold, nutrient-rich waters. The climate that allows the province to harvest over 8 million pounds of oysters every year. It is a $13 million business. And the last in Labrador. And Newfoundland, official name is Newfoundland and Labrador. Well, almost everyone just calls it the province of Newfoundland. That's not entirely correct. The full name is Newfoundland and Labrador, and it was changed in 2001. It has its own time zone. It's not on Eastern time zone. In fact, they have their own time zone. Time zone. Yep, Newfoundland time is 30 minutes ahead of Atlantic time, 90 minutes ahead of Eastern time. They're, they really enjoy it. Okay, puffins. With rocky coastlines, the area is an ideal breeding ground for many seabirds, including the comical looking puffin. That's on the right hand side, the top picture. I mean, left hand side, top picture. The bird is so prevalent and adorable that Newfoundland has adopted the Atlantic puffin as its official provincial bird and has several protected areas for the birds to nest. The best place to see puffins is at Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve. And that is also a great place to see hundreds of other seabirds. The four islands that make up the reserve are just a few kilometers from Avalon Peninsula and are only accessible by boat. Then we have Iceberg Alley and also well watching at the same time. And a small percentage of the icebergs come from the Canadian uh, shoreline. C currents transport these behemoths from Baffin Bay through David Strait into the Labrador Sea and eventually along the eastern and western shores of Newfoundland. The enormous chunks of ice are approximately 10,000 years old. It is estimated between 400 and 800 um, about average medium to large icebergs flow along Iceberg Alley every year. Only about 10% of the iceberg is above water. And the last time I was there, we were in Anthony's, uh, uh, St. Anthony's Point, and we were looking for icebergs. We found one it was late in the season, and I had a whole bus group there, so we just took a picture with the icebergs in the background. And when I finally took a look at the picture, I saw a lot of people I didn't know. Apparently there was other tourists in the area and they just joined the group and took a group picture. So there you go. They're very friendly <laughs> folks. Lanzo Meadows Natural Historic Site is on the bottom left and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is the only authenticated North Site in North America. 
Lancel Meadow is, in, is an archaeological site on the northernmost tip of the Great Northern Peninsula. It is incredible. You see how they build the houses. You see how they did their agriculture. It is really worth visiting. And the last piece on the right-hand side are the jelly bean houses, nicknamed for their colors. And it says, one of the stories is that it's in the early days, sailors who had long been out to sea when returning from fishing grounds would look up to see their homes on the hill. And every now and then, like any coastal town, there was a lot of fog hanging over the city and they couldn't really see well their houses very well. So apparently sailors elected to paint their homes in bright colors to make them more visible to pop and shine against the cool gray backdrop of the mist. So that's apparently one of the stories that how come they turned out this way. And now you have to get, if you want to paint your house uh, a certain color, you have to get permission from the, from the, the city and be, they have their own, an entire color palette for them to see to, that you can choose from, but you can't duplicate colors. And the last one is, uh, this is Red Bay Historic and World Heritage Site, the top picture on the left, and that's from, and that's in Labrador. And that it shows original Basque artifacts, remains, and restored chalupa, their, their ship that they used to, the canoe, whatever they wanted, the boat they used to, to, to hunt whales at this National Historic Site and the World Heritage Site. And you can explore the bony shore, shore with a Parse Canada guide to see the most visible remains of 16th century Basque whaling at Red Bay. You go on the shores along the coast there and you can see a whole bunch of whale bones. So, and I, when I was there the one time, we had two whales just came right into the bay. It was so amazing. Okay, and then we have Signal Hill, the picture in the middle. And Signal Hill was um, was in a, Signal Hill was the site of, of St. John's Harbor defenses for the 17th from the 17th century to the Second World War, and that's where Mr. Marconi received the first the world's first trans transatlantic wireless signal in 1901. Sorry about that. I'm not pronouncing very well right now. And then we have the nor the Newman Wine Vaults and the Newman Wine Vaults. That's where uh, they ate, at one point the practice of aging Newport's Newman's Port in Newfoundland dates back to 1679. They ran into some problems. They were attacked by privateers, so they took anchor in St. John's Harbor, where they found some caves where they could put their port wine and store it in the caves. In the spring, when they headed for England, they found that the port had acquired a bouquet of smoothness and a flavor that did not that did that the port did not have before. So since then. They actually been storing their port in those caves from 1890, it lasted until 1914. And of course, Gander Airport, it's, uh, it is known as sometimes referred to as the crossroads of the world. And the Gander is thanks, it's thanks to its Atlantic Ocean location between Europe and North America. The airport was the perfect refueling stop for the pre-jet engine aircraft. Again, they oversaw the movement of Allied aircraft flying to Europe during World War II and later played host to airplanes from across the Soviet Union that were banned from landing on the American soil. And now Gander Airport has a starring new role on Broadway, on London's West, in Toronto. It's, it's the musical Come From Away, a Tony Award winning show that depicts how Gander became a place of refuge for some 7,000 displaced airplane passengers when the US airspace closed in September 11, 2001. So ladies and gentlemen, that is in a hurry, the whole uh, Canada and three, and three territories. You can travel by train, by car, by plane, or by bus as a group. And some people even travel, uh, you know, travel by bicycle. And that is Journeys, um, our video from us, Journeys by CAA Niagara. That's the last video. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much. So we'll just do the video and then...
For nearly 25 years, CAA Niagara has operated CAA Tuxedo Tours, offering clients a safe and worry-free way of traveling. We began with one and two day trips in Ontario and have steadily grown to over 100 day tours and 24 multi-day tours a year. We have built our reputation on providing true white glove service on our unique itineraries, taking travelers throughout Canada, the United States, and into Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. Because all our tours include accommodation, excursion, meals, and transportation, as well as the services of a CAA Niagara tour director, all our clients know that the details are all taken care of and they can simply relax and enjoy. Our clients love our existing tours, but we know we need to grow and diversify as travelers' interests change. Journeys will allow us to do just that. Our Journeys itineraries will offer our clients expanded options, including adventure travel, relaxation getaways, sports trips, and family vacations. We'll also be offering more solo-friendly itineraries for those who don't have a travel companion, but still want affordable pricing and the comfort of a group. And to all of our existing Tuxedo Tours travelers, don't worry, we'll still be offering the classic trips you know and love. Our goal with Journeys is to offer travel at great prices with unique experiences and provide options outside of the traditional group tour setting. What many travelers don't realize is that you can take advantage of group pricing by traveling at the same time as others. But that doesn't mean you always have to have all the traditional elements of group travel, like a tour director or fully planned itineraries. Our Journeys itineraries offer something for everyone. Whether you prefer the white glove treatment and pre-planned schedules of our classic tours, or the flexibility and additional free time of our family and adventure tours, we have a journey for you. We're redefining group travel. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us for the journey of a lifetime. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I took a lot of your time tonight. I hope that you did find some of, the st some of these provinces interesting, that you will do some kind of travel. I want to thank you so much for your patience and for your interest. Um, my phone number is there, and I work at, and my email is journeys at caanagra.ca. So wonder often and wonder always. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Danielle. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, did you want to answer any questions or? If I can, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Anybody have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can just ask Danielle while she's still here. Or they can always contact me at the office also. Well, at home right now. We have a yeah. quiet group tonight. Well, so I probably, thanks, Danielle. It was a, um, long, just, a long session. Yeah, so. no, it was great. I think we traveled far. Um, you did. <laughs> <laughs> So I did record our sessions, so it'll be up on the Welland Library's YouTube channel probably within the next few days if you wanted to relook at anything. Oh, there's just one question here. Hold on. Oh, somebody just said thank you, Danielle. Oh, you're very welcome. And then I, I was hoping it wouldn't take so long, but what can I say? No, it's great. We had <laughs> Canada's <to> interesting. <laughs> we had to go from one side to the other, so thank you. You did. And thanks so much for CAA for doing this partnership with us, this series of uh, it's, There's No Place Like Home. Uh, we've really enjoyed it. So thank you. It was a very much a pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay. And have a good night. Yeah. Good night, Danette. Good night, everyone. Good night.